You ready for the preaching of the word today? Amen. You can go ahead and get your fingers ready this morning to go and turn to the book of Romans. Turn to the book of Romans chapter 12. Friends, I'm a, I'm a history buff. You know that? I love studying history. I especially love studying the history of the 30s and the 40s, 1930s, 1940s, because that era of time has been ingrained in me since watching these old war movies with my dad since I was a, a young lad. Since I was my son's age, we are watching all of these World War II movies. I love the World War II series and studying that. Kind of lost in all of that regard is what boils up to World War II. And that was the 1930s. And I, I've always been mystified and entrenched. And in, in, in what was it that got into the mind of the people of the world, especially the people of Europe? The science and the study of eugenics, which was the study of the supremacy of the races, which race was more superior to the other race. It, it, it's pretty fascinating Whoop. that one man there in Europe convinced an entire nation and We're just short. It says I got full juice. Okay, I'll try not to bump it. That one man there in Europe was able to convince so many people of the superiority of the white people, of the white race. Friends, that flies tremendously in the face of God's word. Okay? But what was it in that culture, in that environment, when all the peoples, not just Germans, were trying to push the Jewish people away? What was it going on? What was going on in the people's minds? The study of, of eugenics. Even Winston Churchill was on the board of the science of eugenics in the 1930s. So even the le great leaders that we know of were studying all of these different types of science of the day. The science of the day, friends, is oftentimes wrong. And we go back and, and we try to convince ourselves, well, that was a science. That was cutting-edge science back in the 30s. And then for mental illness in the 50s, we were electrocuting people. But that was cutting-edge science in the 50s, trying to, to help them with their mental illness. Friends, there's a lot of good that comes out of science, but also we need to understand that, that science can be fallible at times. And the science that was called of the 30s, the study of eugenics and Hitler arose to power, you know, they started using this, these ideologies to convince other people that they needed to rid themselves of lesser beings, of the Jewish people. And that's wrong. Absolutely wrong. One thing that really moved the people of the world in, in the 30s and the 40s and it still moved the people today is, is political posters. The ads that communicated a, a very powerful and simple thought to its observer. And I, I collected a couple of these old World War II, 1930s type posters and I've got a couple of them here. I don't have enough um, stands to hold them all, but hopefully... These stands are getting a little bit old and rickety, so hopefully they'll, they'll stand up for me. But a couple of them here. Let's see. I'll get my little easel, easel stand here. Put it up there so more people can see it. Let's see. What's this first one? Okay, this is a nice one. An American political poster in 1943 shows, again, the, the background of the people fighting for the revolution, right? We're fighting for freedoms. We're fighting for, for the revolution of the American people. And you may not be able to see it real well, but since 1778 to 1943, Americans will always fight for liberty. I love that one. These are some that I have there in my home. They're in the gun room. <sighs> Let's see. Another one that always makes a good sermon illustration. Let's see. I... Um, Bought these at Pearl Harbor. I'd always always been on my bucket list to go and see the air to see Mighty Mo, Battleship Missouri, there at Pearl Harbor. So I bought these while I was there at Pearl Harbor. This is a good one. Let's see. Let's see if that'll stay there. A careless word, a needless sinking. How many of you guys remember that? A careless word, a needless sinking. There shouldn't be too many hands raised because most everybody here probably don't remember too much, but perhaps you've heard that phrase. And this one kind of echoes that same idea. Let's see. Loose lips. Oh, the world's going on here. What's irritating me? Loose lips. 
Bill, do we have a battery for this blue mic? Because the blue mic died on Wednesday night. I need a battery for that blue one. I'm going to go to it. Do we have a battery for the blue mic? If I can get how long this will last. But loose lips might sink ships. That probably won't stay there. You can imagine as a pastor, these, these will probably preach real word. Talking about the book of James a little bit, and talking about the looseness of the tongue can do a lot of great devastating damage to people. But that's not where I'm going to go with that today because when understanding that a powerful yet simple thought or truth can be conveyed to its observer. The Nazis had their posters as well. The Nazis had their posters that convinced the Germanic people and the European people that the Jews were a dirty people, that they were a dirty race, that they were, that they were vile and evil. They blamed the Jews for them losing World War I, that it was the Jewish people, that they had, they had owned much of the banks and financial resources and uh, different sites in Germany. And they began to strip the Jewish people away, strip those things away from them. One of the posters that we have enjoyed, it's only recently come back to America. It was lost in World War II. It was only used for about a two-week period in the Midwest, maybe through the Midwest of, of Iowa and in Illinois or Kansas and Nebraska area. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by, by the Midwest. But these women workers, female workers, had come alongside these factories and had joined with the factories to take over the roles of, of where their men had left. The men had, had left to go fight the war. And the WOW women, the, the women ordinance workers, came to the call. They, they, they filled the roles in the ranks. And there was a painting that was made by Norman Rockwell called Rosie the Riveter. Remember that? And it showed this really burly woman standing on Hitler's biography, Mein Kampf, with a giant riveting gun on her lap. She's eating a sandwich. And he named it Rosie, Rosie the Riveter. Well, in 1943, a new poster came out. And um, it was just in, in factories for two weeks. And this one began to eclipse the work of Norman Rockwell. It became more famous, more powerfully known, and it was lost to America for decades, and it was only rediscovered in the, in the mid-1980s. But it has now become known as Rosie the Riveter, even though that's not who this person was. It's not the title of this picture. But many of you have begun to be familiar with that. We've got a, a clip uh, right there. It shows you we can do it. The women ordinance workers. All the workers, the, the wow ladies, <laughs> wore the red bandanas. That was part of their uniform. That was part of their work. And, and uh, so this is the, the wow, the we can do it. It became a, a symbol of American volunteerism throughout the 80s and 90s and up to today. It became a, a symbol of the feminist movement. But today, it's, again, the symbol of the volunteerism movement. The we can do it. We can do it. We can get together and we can do it. We can do that job. And I think we even have a, a special guest this morning. I think Rosie, the Riveter, her, her, her granddaughter perhaps, her granddaughter may be with us this morning. Let's see. Miss Rosie, are you there? Oh, there she is. There she is. All right. Come here. Come here, Rosie. All right. What do you think? What do you think about all these people here? Is there a message you want to tell all these people? We can do it. Oh, we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to make sure that you can hear it over here, too? Make sure they all hear it. What was it you said? What's the message you have for today? We can do it. All right. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Miss Rosie the Riveter. I appreciate you. You doing it? You can keep, you can keep going? We can do it. Fantastic job. Fantastic job. Anything else? We can do it. 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 All right. Thank you. We can do it. 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 I think we got the message. We can do it. I think it's time to go. I think it's time to go. Time to go.
totally unscripted, really. <laughs> That's just a little fun there we have today. We can do it. The title of this morning's message, We Can Do It. Amen? Through the power of Almighty God, we can do it. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Usually I preach out of the NIV, but today I found a translation in the ESV that I enjoy. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. If you're there, say amen. God's Word says today, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Let's pray. God, I thank you again today for your word, and God, may we continue to understand who we are in Christ Jesus, is that we are a people, we are the church, that God, you have said to your people, to your church, that we can do it. God, may the church continue to arise, may the church continue to be used, God, may this church continue to reach this community, God, may we continue to reach and touch people's lives. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. God, as we continue to walk through this passage, God, I pray you again take my stutter and my stammer to be able to speak clearly and concisely to your people today. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Friends, this passage in the book of Romans in chapter 12 says that we each have an ability. We each have an ability, and the question that I'm raising today is what is yours? What is yours? Every person in the body of Christ has an ability that is to be used. Every person in the body of Christ has an ability that is to be used. Friends, these gifts that are outlined here in the book of Romans in chapter 12 is a little bit different than the gifts of the Spirit. These are gifts to the church, to be used by the church. The gifts of the Spirit that the same author outlines there in the 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's the gifts of the Spirit. Today, these are a little bit different. These are the gifts of the Spirit to the church. They're they're a little bit of a weaker understanding than the gifts of the Spirit that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But here in this passage, Romans 12, we see different gifts to the church, gifts in the church. The first one deals with the gift of prophesying. The Bible tells us that it is gauged in proportion to our faith. Gift of prophesying. Now the word here, and this is why Bible study is so important, when we can do word studies, because it's not exactly the same as the gift of prophecy. They're two different entities. One is stronger than the other. The word here is propheteia, not propheteo. You're like, whoop de doo Big deal, right? But they have a succinct meaning. Propheteia means prediction, an inspired speaker or poet. Propheteo means to foretell events, to divine, to exercise the prophetic office. A little bit different, aren't they? So the word here, propheteia, that is found in this passage of Scripture means an inspired speaker or poet, sometimes used in a little bit of prediction, but prediction is different than prophecy. A lot of us can predict different things. We can predict different things by watching the news, can't we, on TV. We can predict that the stock market's going to go up or down by whatever country happens to be defaulting this week. That's called prediction. That's not necessarily prophesying. But the word here, prophetia, talks more about an an inspired speaker or even a poet. Talks about an eloquent individual that can speak well. Friends, this list that is found in the book of Romans chapter 12 is is used to govern those who use these gifts. It's It's a list that tells the people with these giftings how to use them. Therefore, a prophet is not to be governed by his emotions or by his love of speaking, but by his entire dependence on the Spirit of Almighty God. That is the role of this individual. The nature of this gift, of the gift of prophesying, is not primarily prediction, but the communication of revealed truth that will both convict and build up the hearers. In other words, it is preachers and teachers and evangelists that have that gift of prophesying, have the ability to to correctly and concisely give God's word. The next gift is the gift of service, which many people in the church have today. 
This is serving the needs of others in the body, working for the kingdom of God. These are the people that help us week in and week out that are, that are not seen, that are perhaps behind the scenes, that serve you. A lot of times it's our ushers, our greeters, those that arrive early in the morning to make coffee, to provide the donuts for you, to arrange those for you. A lot of times it's our nursery workers and our, and our teachers. They're doing gifts of service to the church, helping with painting, helping with cleaning. They're oftentimes not seen by the body of Christ, but they're working. The next gift is the gift of teaching. Again, these are teachers teaching others the word of God. In our culture today, this is mostly children's ministry. Do you understand that 90% of believers today were led to Christ before the age of 18? 90% of all of us here today came to Christ when we were younger than 18. That is why children's and youth ministry is so vitally and extremely important. If 90% of us are coming to Christ before the age of 18, then that's where a lot of our attention should be going. Reaching kids, reaching teenagers. 10% of us will come to Christ after the age of 18. 10%. So if you're an investing man, if you're a businessman, where are you going to put your attention? You're going to put your attention in the 90%. That's not to negate the other percentages. It's not to negate the rest of the ministry that's taking place because it is all, 100% of the ministry is important to God. But it's just simple mathematics, friends. Simple mathematics. The next gift is a gift of exhortation. This is one who encourages others. There are several that go around and encourage. Maybe they encourage a pastor or a teacher. They encourage different ones in the body. They go up and they give them a little bit of encouragement. And that is something that is greatly needed today in the church. With all of the discouraging things that are happening in our world today, we need exhorters. We need the encouragers to stand up and be able to give an add a boy and add a girl to the people in the body of Christ. That's what we need, exhorters. The churches that really seem to be growing right now are the churches that are majoring in exhortation. The churches that are growing well right now are the ones that are, that are doing solidly exhortation. They may not do much else. They won't teach on sin, but they'll preach on encouragement, 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 because that is what people want to hear. They want to hear encouragement. And that's not necessarily a good balanced diet. But we need this gift in the church today all across America is the gift and ministry of the exhorter, of the encourager. The next gift, the gift of contribution. This is giving beyond the tithe, because all the people in this generation were expected to give to the church, expected to give of the tithe. The gift of contribution is an offering or blessing that is given to others. Sometimes people give different things to the church. Sometimes it's a piece of equipment. Sometimes it's a piece of land to sell. Sometimes it's a car to house of promise. That is a gift of contribution that is given to meet the, meet the needs of others in the body of Christ. Those things take place, and those things are are necessary in the body. We must have them. Next gift is of leadership. The Bible says in the two different translations, it says zealously and diligently. This infers a great passion. The gift of leadership, that the leader must lead zealously and lead diligently, must lead passionately. A lot of times those leaders will wear out other people around them because those leaders oftentimes don't take the pause button to celebrate a victory. A lot of times those leaders enjoy the victory and then they go on to the next battle. They go on to the next big deal, the next big project because those leaders will lead diligently. They'll lead passionately. They'll lead zealously. The last gift is the gift of mercy. Mercy, the Bible says here, is it brings mercy cheerfully. Bringing mercy. Sometimes it's visitation. The pastor is not the only one in the body of Christ that's supposed to go and do visitation. Amen? The pastor is not supposed to be the only one going to the hospital or going to people's homes to visit them. The body of Christ is tasked with that job, going around. And a lot of times this is where our our retirees really blossom and they they really bloom in this ministry, be able to go and and sit and and exhort and and show mercy to those that that are dejected, that are downtrodden, that are broken. They can give them that encouraging word. They can give them that mercy. A lot of times whenever, maybe whenever my wife is showing a little bit of mercy, a little bit of a soft heart, 
you know, she starts getting a quivering lip and starts getting a little red-eyed because anytime somebody sympathizes and empathizes with my wife, she starts crying a little bit because somebody showed her a little bit of attention. Some of you have wives like that as well. My wife is a very, very strong woman, but she just wishes that people would just not say anything sympathetic to her, <laughs> especially in public because she doesn't like to cry. But those words that are spoken to her and maybe to your wife are powerful, powerful words that while she may regret it at the moment because she doesn't want to cry in front of anybody, but she eats off of that encouragement. She eats off of that mercy, that empathy for days, knowing that somebody cared, that gift of mercy. Friends, all of that together, these are our abilities, the abilities of the church. These abilities are given to us so that we may give to others. So that we may give to others. The gifts of the church are given to you, not for you to, to hog and to hoard. For you to give. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says this, that in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, there, there was a quote on Facebook that my wife saw this last week, and, you know, it uh, quotes Martin Luther. So everything on Facebook is always right and true, right, you know? But it said this, no tree bears fruit for its own use. Everything in God's will gives itself away. The tree, the apple trees that we have in our areas, they don't just provide apples for their own use and for their own consumption. They produce and produce and produce, and they provide. They provide for the hungry, for the malnourished. They provide for those that want to eat an apple. I've never seen a tree open up its mouth and eat an apple of its own. It doesn't happen. It's not in its nature. And the church, it shouldn't be in our nature either. We are to provide fruit for others around us to eat. The second main point today is that our abilities are, are, are attached to our faith. Our abilities are attached to our faith. The book of James, chapter 2, verse 14 and 18. Now, just slow down a minute. Who is James? The book of James. Who is James? Jesus' brother. Jesus' younger brother. This is not James, the son of Alphaeus, the disciple. This is James, the younger brother of Jesus. So J Jesus and James grew up together. Okay, you understand this. Jesus and James grew up in the same household with the same mom and dad. And it says here, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is it? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. This is Jesus' little brother. James knew Jesus better than anybody else. And James accepted his older brother as the son of God. Now, if that's not a tall order. Growing up in the same household with an older brother, I don't know of a single sibling yet that would think that their older brother is the son of God. <laughs> James is acknowledging the fact here that, look, my brother bled and died for you on that cross. He gave you that grace and mercy. What are you going to do now that you have that grace and mercy? You are now a religious person. You are now a person of faith. But what are you going to do with that now? Our faith ought to compel us to reach and serve this community. Let me say that again. Our faith ought to compel us to reach and serve a community. Our faith does not compel us to sit on a chair in Sunday morning church service week in and week out and not do anything. Our faith, to be real and genuine, compels us to love God, 
to reach Jesus' heart by going. That's the heart of Jesus. Go and make disciples. That is what our faith ought to compel us to do. That's why Martin Luther, going back to him again, he hated this book. He hated the book of James. In fact, back, in, back when they were having all of that was going on and they were splitting and breaking away from the church and they started the Lutheran church, he didn't want to start a new church. He wanted to reform the church that he was a part of. He wanted to reform it and change it from within, but it was just too much. He was a very bombastic personality, kind of a, kind of a loud mouth a little bit. He posted the 90, 95 thesis on the door of the church, I believe it was a Wurttemberg, and he stated all the things that were wrong with his church. Now, of course, that's not a good way to start off, okay? Martin Luther hated the book of James because he wanted more about grace. He wanted to focus more on grace. It's the grace of God, the grace of God. By grace alone can you be saved. Grace, grace, grace. But you understand the culture and the environment that Luther was in at that time was a works-based church. It was a hugely works-based church at that time, and that, during that era. Luther was sick of, of working themselves into heaven because he knew you could not work yourself into heaven. He said, the book of James shouldn't even be in the New Testament canon. We should just get rid of it because that's the culture that he's in. Now let's skip forward several hundreds of years to the American culture. Now our American culture is a grace-based church with very little works. You see how culture changes over centuries? So a lot of times, why is it that the, that the churches of today, especially the American churches, are always pulling and pulling and pulling, trying to get volunteers, trying to get people in the church to work? Is because over the last century, the American church has also switched from a works-based church to a grace-based church. And grace is good because only man can be saved through grace. But we forgot and we left the works behind. We completely went the other way. We completely went to the, to the, the extreme side of the pendulum. Friends, we must have grace, but we also must prove our faith is true and genuine by how we're building the kingdom of God. Friends, in this passage of Scripture, faith is described as our religion, our belief as Christians. James surmises that our religion, our belief in Jesus is dead if we do not partake I get all excited and I get rolling. There goes the mic. Three, testing, one, two. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I have to do something else. Don't move. <laughs> Friends, again, James surmises that our religion, our belief in Jesus Christ is dead if we don't partake of working in the harvest field, if we do not partake in laboring for the kingdom. Your inability or your lack of ability in this life does not negate the requirement for you to labor for Christ in some manner. We've got to work. We've got to work. We've got to do something for God's kingdom. For Nehemiah, we just got done with the Nehemiah series. That was laying brick at a time, brick after brick. That was building the kingdom at that time. Today, it looks differently. We're probably not going to lay a brick there on a pallet of, uh, of concrete and building walls. We're doing things differently. Friends, we've got to continue to work in God's harvest field. We were uh, picking corn, some sweet corn this last week. And we were in the, took my old pickup truck out there and rammed it into the, the cornfield, get a little bit farther in there. And uh, those, those corn stalks were about yay high or so. And uh, the kids get out of the truck with me, and we're all picking corn together. And I can't see the kids, right, because they're yay high. And, and Judah and Jenna are, are shorter than the corn stalks. We, we start circling out from the pickup truck, getting baskets of corn, and we start bringing it back to the truck. Testing. 
we, uh, we bring all the corn back to the pickup truck and we, we set it in the truck. And after a while, I noticed that one of, our, one of our members is missing. I can't find little Jenna anywhere. And she is, again, shorter than the corn stalks. We start calling her, Jenna, where are you at? I can't see you. Jenna, where are you at? She doesn't respond. I'm like, okay, where'd she go? There's a big ditch. There's a big canal filled with water on the front of the truck there, just, uh, you know, 20 yards away. So you're going to make sure you know where your daughter's at. And uh, Jenna, answer me. Where are you at? No response. Start walking back towards the back of the truck from inside. I'm in the cornfield. I'm walking to the back of the truck. And I cut my hands and said, Jenna, where are you at? Then I see a little head pop up in the back seat of the truck. Uh oh. Everybody say, uh oh. She is in the middle of the harvest field and jumped inside the pickup truck because she's kind of allergic to work a little bit. She didn't want to pick corn, so she jumped in the back of the truck and decided to lay down and have a little bit of a nap without telling any of us. We had a come to Jesus moment right then and there in the middle of that cornfield. Isn't it kind of how God the Father's done? Hadn't he just driven the church right in the middle of the harvest field in a 4x4 pickup truck and said, hey, the harvest is white, but the workers are few. There's only four of us in this huge, gigantic cornfield. There's no way that me and my family could wipe out that cornfield. There's absolutely no way. Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send workers. And I'm in the middle of this cornfield picking corn, sweating like crazy, the hot sun overhead. And one of the workers is sleeping in the truck. But is that the picture of the American church a little bit today too? God has done everything he can to put you in the middle of his harvest field. He's given you the tools. He's just asking you by the sweat of your brow to go and reach the harvest. And when God's calling for you, where are you at? Where are you at? What are you doing for my kingdom? What are you doing for my harvest? All of a sudden, he sees your head pop up in the back seat because you were lying low because you didn't want anybody to see that you weren't doing nothing. I pray to God that the conviction of the Holy Spirit doesn't have a come-to-Jesus moment with us. Sometimes that's right where we're at, isn't it? Jenna doesn't have a lot of the abilities. She doesn't have the discernment to know which ears of corn are, are the best and which ones are long, which ones are fat, which ones are skinny. I just needed her help. I just needed her to be out there. I wasn't, I wasn't basing everything on her abilities or her inabilities or her, will, her ability to interpret which ones are ready and not. I just needed her to carry corn. But she was missing, and it set back the whole progress by a few minutes. Is God looking for us today? Are we laying down in the backseat of that pickup truck? We hear God calling and calling. We hear the cries of the lost. We hear about the harvest. We, see, we hear the other people working, but what are we doing? Friends, we work because we love Jesus Christ. We do not work for the love of a leader. A leader can perhaps encourage. A leader can perhaps inspire. People will sometimes go to work because of an inspiring leader or speaker, but that's the wrong motivation. We should work in the harvest field of Christ because we love Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, that whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, and not for men. Not for men. You don't work for me, friends. You don't work for a pastor. You may like me, you may hate me. You don't work because of pastor. You don't set us up on pedestals. You work for the love of Christ. If I could have some... Friends, we've got these clipboards I mentioned earlier. There's different things that are on those clipboards. Just pass those around now and maybe pray these moments to ask God what perhaps God would have you to do. If you're already working and laboring in God's harvest field, that's great. You don't need to sign anything. But God is wooing and calling different ones today to do something, even if it's maybe small and insignificant. Like little Jenna doesn't know much about what to do. But one thing she does know how to do is carry corn to and from the pickers to the pickup truck, and she can do that. It's not small. It's not insignificant. It helps the process. 
Friends, I don't know what it looks like in your life, but there's clipboards all throughout this church, and just find those where you're at and pass them from the front to the back, and we'll begin to accrue lists together for moving forward this month of August. What is your ability? What can you do? Third and finally today is that God wants to use your ability. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 says this, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. God wants to use your ability. And with that, we must acknowledge that we are available despite our earthly schedule. We are available. And God, we're going to make ourselves available. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Despite my earthly schedule, God, I will be available. We must acknowledge that we are gifted in some way by God for use in his kingdom. And thirdly, we must seek God to find our field of ministry. We must be proactive, friends, in finding out what our ability is, not the pastor. The pastor doesn't, isn't responsible to tell you what your gift is. You're responsible for asking God what your gift is. The best ones to help you with that is your family, those that know you uh, the best. I could perhaps tell you what my son and my daughter's ability would be, their gifts in the church might be, but I can't answer for you. Only you, perhaps your family, but you and God have got to talk to find out what your ability is. What is it that God is putting on your heart? What is God putting on your heart? Miss Ashley, would you come this morning? Let us stand today all across this place. Let's stand. Friends, God is looking for a few good men and women. A few good men and women who will answer the call of God. God is searching for those that he might send to the hurting. That he might send some to teach the children. To send some to reach the lost of Delta County. Friends, whenever there's an, a car accident out on the interstate highway, there's three types of people. There's the rescuers. The rescuers will jump right in the middle of that soup. They don't, car that, they don't care that cars are smashing and clanging and banging all around them and there's fires and gasoline might explode. The rescuers don't care about the danger. They just want to get in there and rescue somebody. They want to rip those doors open and they want to get that seat buckle, buckle off and they want to reach in there and put somebody in a fireman's carry or, or drag their bodies away from the flames. Those are the rescuers. Those are the first type of people. Second type of people are the gawkers. The gawkers, the rubbernecks. You ever been on an interstate highway that's going five miles an hour and it is driving you nuts and you're thinking, what is going on? And you finally get up to this little tiny accident where one lane of traffic is held up, only one, and it's a tiny little fender bender and all of a sudden you get past that fender bender and all of a sudden the traffic starts zooming up to 50, 60, 70 miles an hour and you're thinking, that little fender bender sh shut down this whole thing? Are you kidding me? It's because the gawkers, the rubbernecks, we all had to slow down to take a look. There are some in the church that are kind of like that, the gawkers. We like to look at all the ministry being done. We like to look and we like to take pictures we like to show up and see the signs and wonders, but we're not going to spend two minutes in prayer praying for them. There's a few people in the church that are, that are the gawkers. They, they like to look at all the cool stuff. They want to see God move, but they're not willing to invest in God moving. Amen? And the third ones are the pastors by. Pastor buys, they don't care. They don't care that there's an accident. They just want to get, get going. They're upset about the fact that they're shut down on the highway. They're upset about the fact that something has interrupted their travel time. Urgh. I don't care that somebody's burning to death. I don't care that somebody is, is dying in that car. I have got a two o'clock appointment. I wish I had a motorcycle right now. Zip up through the line or get around the sides because their schedule's more important. The passers-by. 
Friends, there's the three types of people at an accident. Which one are you? The passers-by may consider the wounded and the hurting as an impediment to their progress. They curse the situation because their progress was slowed. These may be with some with tattoos and facial piercings and colored hair. When they sit in your seat on Sunday morning, they come up to that person that's just come to church perhaps for the first time and this old dear saint may come up and said, you're sitting in my chair. The passers-by, they don't care. They don't care that the person is there for the first time. That person is an impediment to their chair. Friends, I believe that the majority of the people in the church today are rescuers. I choose to believe that many people that are here today are rescuers. That we have a calling upon our life that we don't care about all that's going on about us, but all we see is the people that might burn to death if we don't open that door up and yank them out. Don't think that it's the pastor's job to go after the lost by himself. No. The people that are rescued from car accidents are your average Joes, the average people that are on the highway. Most people that are rescued at a car accident didn't come with lights on their car. Just regular folks. I'd like to have the prayer team come this morning. Friends, may we continue to pray for a renewed generation in the church that will jump in to help the cause like Rosie the Riveter. There's a battle going on. There's a battle going on, friends, and a lot of people in World War II had to leave their posts, had to leave their farms, had to leave their factories to go to battle. God's asking, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And there's those rosy, the riveters that are out there that says, here am I, Lord, send me. So that those posts that are vacated might be filled with the worker. Those posts might be filled with the willing who are determined to do their part. Friends, there's those posts in the church that need to be filled. And like Rosie, like Rosie, you can do it. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it.